according to the. All right, welcome everybody. Take it away, Nate. Hang on, I've done a bad thing already. Um, <laughs> my chat window just blocking my other stuff. Okay, there we go. Hi, um, thank you so much for coming today. I would like to talk to you a little bit about computer security. Um, it says operational security in the um, in the talk title. Really, that just means like the practices of being secure overall. Um, so this is on ways to keep primarily human subjects data safe from attackers, from bad people. Um, these same techniques can be useful in all parts of your life. So to keep your bank accounts safe, to keep your emails safe. Um, but I'm mainly focusing on the human subjects data end of this. Um, so why are we interested in this? Because we collect just a ton of data on people participating in our studies and our participants are trusting us to keep that data safe. If we lose access to that data, if somebody bad gets it, um, not only can it get the IRB on our case and mess up your research or the center's research as a whole, um, this can cause actual harm to your participants. Um, so a lot of times people say like, well, we don't collect information that's that sensitive really. Um, and I think that is kind of bogus. Some things I've seen this collect in the past are information on depression and anxiety, uh, other mental health issues, history of substance abuse, history of childhood abuse, sexual abuse, um, spouse and partner reports of some of those same things. For billing and payment information, we collect information on whether people are citizens, um, which might be interesting to people outside the center sometimes. Um, also social security numbers and other payment information we need to file tax reports. Um, with this stuff, bad people could embarrass or blackmail our participants. Uh, they could apply for a credit card or even a mortgage in people's names. Like they could do actual damage to people who come to offer us their time and energy. So we wanna stop this as much as we possibly can. So one thing that I think about sometimes is like, why do people try and steal data? Like, What, what do they get out of this? Um, sometimes people do it just to be a jackass or they're mean. Like this is actually a thing. People do this for the lulls um, or to be a stalker. I'm not super concerned about that for our purposes here. Although in your own personal life that may come up sometime. Um, Sometimes researchers can be targeted by people who are trying to stop things they feel are unethical. I don't think that's much of a thing we have to worry about at CHM, but if you ever get into the world of uh, animal research, primate like research in particular, like this is a thing that can be a serious issue. Um, the issue we're gonna focus on mostly is people who are in this for money, fat stacks of cash, or even thin stacks of cash spread over a lot of people. So attackers, bad people, how do they get our data? The easiest way, probably one of the most common ways is just physically stealing a thing. Um, remember that if somebody takes your computer or your phone, they maybe can access the files that are on it and all the stuff that it connects to. So that's your email, that's maybe the servers, that's maybe Box or Dropbox. Um, and this is a thing you just can't prevent. One time I was at a conference and I saw a faculty person put down his computer, look away for maybe 10 seconds, and he looked back, the computer was just gone. Um, and you know, even if you can never let your attention drift, you can't stop yourself from being mugged. So since you can't prevent this from happening, you need to plan for the possibility that someday your computer gets stolen or your phone gets stolen and mitigate the consequences of that happening. Another thing that can happen and happens to a lot of people is that you run some bad program or malware on your computer. And once a program like that runs, it can do anything that you could do uh, if you were trying to be your own worst enemy. So they can encrypt all your files and demand a ransom. They can look through your photos for anything that looks like it's gonna be embarrassing and demand a ransom. They could put photos on your computer that are illegal or really embarrassing and demand a ransom. Um, they can also run a program that just silently looks over all the files on your computer for things like names and birth dates, social security numbers, and then just use that data to do bad things that can get them money, like open credit cards in other people's names. 
This is another thing that's really hard to totally prevent. So you need to plan for the possibility that this will happen to you someday and mitigate the consequences of that. Um, another thing that happens is somebody can steal your password and then they log in as you. Uh, sometimes people can fish you. So they make a fake website that looks like a real website and trick you into entering your password on it. And then they can log in as you. Um, that's not uncommon, but even more common, like thousands of times more common is password reuse. So you use the same password on a whole bunch of websites and each of those websites is supposed to encrypt their passwords so nobody can uh, use them if they steal them. But websites are terrible. And so some of them don't encrypt their passwords and passwords get stolen all the time. And if you've used that password on a whole bunch of websites, then you can see the problem. Um, this one is actually pretty preventable, but still it's hard to totally get rid of. And so you want to plan for the possibility that this might happen and mitigate the consequences. Uh, kind of last way I'm going to talk about here that you can lose access to research data is if you accidentally share too much. Uh, a really common way of doing this is emailing. If you're emailing data that has identifiers in it, in particular, you're doing something that's real dangerous. Um, it's really easy just to accidentally email somebody outside the university or um, just like email is also not encrypted as it travels across the internet. And so people can look at that sometimes. So you wanna be really careful when you're sharing data that you don't inadvertently share identifying data in particular um, and try and work real hard to make it so that doesn't happen. So what did all of these situations have in common? They're all really hard to totally prevent. And you need to have a solution that's going to, or a set of solutions that's going to be resilient to people screwing up. You know, if you look at accounts of accident investigation reports, like if you like reading that kind of stuff, you're weird, um, but I still love you. Um, there's a really common pattern that emerges in just a huge number of disasters. There's this risk of a bad thing happening, and to stop that, we make people take steps to prevent the bad thing from happening. But those steps are annoying, or they're expensive, or they take a long time. Um, and so people kind of get lazy and the bad thing keeps not happening. People stop doing the things and then the bad thing happens. And then we blame the people for not doing those steps that were annoying and didn't seem to help very much. Um, I mean, this is responsible for, this pattern is responsible for car accidents, aircraft accidents, chemical accidents, nuclear accidents, and tons and tons of data loss accidents. Um, in general, if your security plan relies on people being really vigilant and really careful all the time, you're gonna be disappointed. Like that's just changing people's nature and trying to get people to change their nature is really, really hard and you're gonna fail at it. You know, we're gonna fail unless we invest a ton in kind of ongoing training and enforcement and doing those things is annoying and expensive and uh, invasive and time consuming. So we're not gonna do that because we're humans. So anything that you do to keep stuff secure in the long run needs to be easy enough that it's the default thing that you do. Like it's just the standard way that you operate. While I am big into like a systems thinking um, approach to security in general, you got to remember that security is made up of individual people and each person, yourself included, has power. And this is an area where you need to be responsible adults. So some of the things I talk about here are probably going to be different than what you're doing now. Um, some of them may be really small changes and really easy changes. I'll focus on those in particular because they're easy. Um, but like changing how you store passwords is a big thing. Um, and just because something is ultimately easier once you're good at it doesn't mean that transitioning is not hard. Uh, some of the things I'm talking about might cost you actual like money or make you make a purchase request. And it's important to, you know, it's important to think of security as an investment and to put in the time you need to learn how to do things in a secure way. And, you know, if something does cost money or means you have to fill out a purchase request form, 
for a tool that will make your life actually easier, make it easier to do research in a secure way, do those things. I'm happy to support you. You know, we're all happy to support you in that endeavor. So, so good security, what does it look like? Um, well, good security is like an ogre, it has layers. Um, also, it's resilient to people making errors and lapses in judgment, just like ogres are. Um, it's really, really hard to take a project that's ongoing and just be like, I'm gonna slap security on it as a quick fix. What you really wanna do is plan with regards to what data you're gonna be using and how you're gonna be using it and what you really need to do your work um, and find ways to do that work in an efficient way that also doesn't put people at risk. Um, and it's really critical to be realistic about those things up front. If you feel like, well, it's gonna be annoying if we leave this thing out of our data set, but it's probably better if we do, um, think real hard about that plan because if it's annoying, people are gonna to tend to try to get around it in some way. Uh, it's a lot better to find some way up front that we can do what we need to do in a way that is not dangerous. Um, so, you know, it's a lot to talk about here, but all is not lost and there are a ton of things that you can do. You know, I'll talk about some of those concrete ones right now. Um, yeah, what can you do already? Um, the biggest, most general one is to limit the stuff that you can access, especially um, in any research project, limit the number of people with access to subject identifiers, identifying information. Um, as far as HIPAA is concerned, all identifiers are equal. In terms of actual risk of damages, they are absolutely not. Like a visit date and a social security number are both considered an identifier. Um, if we lose a bunch of SSNs, that's a huge deal. If we lose some visit dates, like that's bad. It's a reportable event and the IRB will be angry at us, but the risk that somebody actually sees harm from that is much smaller. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so think about the stuff that you need to do your research on an ongoing basis and who on your team needs to do their work. You probably have some people who need to deal with billing, other people who need to deal with research, maybe not a ton of people who do both on a regular basis. Um, this is a great thing to do because it attacks all of the possible ways that data get out. If somebody steals your phone or your computer, well, the identifying data wasn't on it. If you accidentally send a file to the wrong person, there's no identifiers in it. Um, if you run malware, there's no identifiers to get out. Um, so we can help you with this. We can set up data download pipelines that put identifying information in a separate place. Um, if you're using something like REDCap, it has special support for identifiers so that not everybody has to see like social security numbers. Always, always ask us for help because we are so happy to get out in front of this stuff um, and make your life easier and also make us not lose much data sometime. <clears throat> The biggest technical thing that I can say is we have a lot of laptops, a lot of phones that get at our stuff on an ongoing basis. The most important thing you can do with that is to make it so when you open up that computer or you wake up your phone, it asks you for a password. Um, like things like fingerprint and face sensors, I think are totally fine for this purpose. They can't defeat, you know, dedicated government attackers, but I don't care about dedicated government attackers. I care about that guy who picked my phone, my computer up off the conference table. Um, it is so much better if you are willing to have a password on your phone and then your face unlocks at 90% of the time or a password on your computer and your fingerprint unlocks at 99% of the time um, than it is to just have your computer pop open as soon as you, as soon as you touch it. Kind of on the same lines, if you're using a Mac, turn on File Vault. Just Google how to do that. It'll take two seconds. In Windows, there's a thing called BitLocker that does the same thing. What this does is it takes all the data on your computer and encrypts it. So if somebody does steal your computer, um, they can't even take the disk out and look at the data on there to get at your stuff. 
you know, if you have a password protected, locking your device and your data is encrypted, that means that if somebody steals like this computer right here, right, probably we tell the IRB it happened, but it's not going to be a big deal. Nobody can get at this thing. This changes the problem from like, oh, I need to buy a new computer and ESA is mad at me for that, um, to like, I need to buy a new computer and the IRB is auditing my project, or I need to buy a new computer and we somehow need to make things right for participants who got credit cards open in their name from our study. Um, also on the like running bad programs front, just on your computer, turn on automatic updates, let it update. Um, this, every version of operating systems fix a bunch of security bugs, let it happen. It almost never causes problems and the risk of an update causing a problem to you is so much smaller than the risk of some bug being out there that's easily exploded. Um, similarly, both Windows and Macs, and you know Linux has all this stuff too, but if you're using Linux, I'm guessing you know what you're doing pretty well. Um, you have a, a firewall on your computer that can stop other programs on the internet from connecting to you. Just turn that on. You are never going to notice it's there unless you're doing something where you already know what you're doing to you know, make it work for you. So turn it on, let it be. Um, and on Apple devices, this is maybe a little more controversial, but um, there is a find my device option on every Apple thing sold. That will let you, among other things, just say like, oh, somebody stole my phone. Next time it gets on the network, wipe it. Or your computer, the same way, just, just delete everything on it. Um, you know, even if there is some weird bug that lets people get past the encryption or something, like if the data's gone, the data's gone and nobody can do anything bad with it. You're probably not getting that computer back anyhow. So, you know. One other thing that I've been doing personally for a while now is I used to mount the study drive on my computer. Um, and partly I stopped doing it because it doesn't work super well for me. Um, but it's also because if I do get a bad program, if I do get malware, then, oh my God, it sees all of study. It can go out and do, just run rampant all over. Um, so what do I do instead? Um, I have a program called Transmit that lets me open up the study drive in a separate program. And it's possible that Malware could like look into transmit into this stuff, but it's not the same as just looking onto what the computer thinks is its native own files, basically. Um, and I can do everything I need in transmit. Like I can open files directly and edit them and save them. Um, it cost me $45. It has been worth every single penny. You know, I'm sure there are good Windows programs that are roughly equivalent. I don't know what they are, but they are worth at least thinking about. Um, Certainly, I wouldn't leave study connected like just all the time when I'm not doing anything related to it, because that seems, you know, riskier than necessary. The other thing I'm going to talk about a fair amount is passwords, because password reuse in particular is just a huge problem. Um, if you've been here, I don't know, any time since Ty has been here, he's told you about his password non-reuse trick, where you're like, you have some password that's kind of secure that you use everywhere, but then you also append a little bit of stuff to the end. So like, if you're on Amazon, maybe it's like my password plus AM, or on brain imaging, it's like my password plus BI. And I tried that for a while and it did not work very well. Because um, I wanted to use this everywhere. And different websites have different dumb password rules. So like this one's like, oh, you need to have no uppercase letters. I'm like, well, my password has an uppercase letter and what do I do now? Um, I'm never gonna remember this. Um, and then also like, I'd come back to website later and be like, oh yeah, Amazon, was that with an AM or an AZ? Did Google have GO or GG or GOO? Um, and so it just, it didn't fit my brain very well. If this does, that's great and you can use it. Um, what I do now is I use a password manager. 
There are a whole bunch of them out there. I use one called 1Password because I got it a long time ago. Um, these days, the university has a license for everybody to get, like students and staff can get something called LastPass, which is a similar program. There's another thing called Bitwarden that people like. Um, all these programs work in fundamentally the same way. They store all your passwords in one big encrypted file. And you have a password that decrypts it. That's the password that you know. It's the password that's in your head. You only use that password for this one thing. Uh, the companies in charge of these things, so one password can't like decrypt my file. Um, it's just my computer and my phone and my browser. Those all have a program installed on them to read that file and fill in passwords where it needs to go, passwords where they need to go. Um, yeah, uh, this, pass, this program can also, hang on a second, let me just, oh man, I've done a bad thing, sorry. Um, sorry, this password also, the programs also have a way to generate passwords that are secure and unique. Um, and then all of them will cost you some subscription fee, except the one that's licensed by the university already. And for that fee, they'll sync your password between all of your devices. Um, so this is super helpful because it means that each one of my sites can have its own password. If there are special requirements, I can tweak the password to make it fit that site's requirements. Um, and I don't know any of my passwords anymore except for the one for the password manager program or other ones that I have to type frequently. So things to look for in this, um, it has to be a thing that you look at and you're like, I'll use this. Um, if it's ugly or clunky or gross, you're not going to use it and don't bother. Um, you have to understand how this thing works some and you have to be willing to actually interact with it. Um, text, uh, sorry, I'm getting texts. It's really weird. Um, there is a way I can turn that off. I don't know how to do it. Sorry. Um, your passwords. Yes, yeah, so one other really common tool in this, there are big published databases of all the passwords that have come out of password breaches from Adobe, from, I don't know, everybody else who has lost their giant password databases. And these programs will just check to see like, hey, does this password occur anywhere in there? If not, if it does, it will warn you. Um, sometimes the program that wants to paste the thing in can't do it for whatever reason. So it's really nice to be able to type a thing in. For example, would you rather type in the thing on the top or the thing on the bottom? Like they're both really long secure passwords, um, but especially if you're typing on a phone, like, man, do I not want to type the thing on the top? Uh, so it's nice if your program can generate both kinds of things. Um, and so we're talking about passwords here, like, well, we have to talk about phishing again a little bit more. Like if, this isn't, a, if you type your bad password, if you type your real password into a bad website, like how does this protect you from that? Um, and your password manager can help you do that a little bit because it normally pastes your password in. Um, and that pasting in is kind of cued by what the web address is. And fake websites have different addresses than real websites. So your password manager can be like, hey, I don't know what website, you're, this looks kind of like your whisk one, but like, it's not the whisk one. Do you still want me to paste it in? He'd be like, no, no, I don't want that at all. Um, the other thing that a good password manager can do is set up and handle two-factor authentication. So everybody in this meeting probably has used the university's Duo system, which is kind of an annoying version of two-factor authentication. Um, but the basic idea of that is you log in and not only do you need to know the password for your website, hang on for one second. Um, uh, 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 uh. So it means that, you know, even if somebody has your password, still some second thing is going to intervene and be like, hey, do you have the, uh, this code or can you tap yes on your device? Um, 
it's not just a university website that support this. Like everybody else does. Google, Amazon, like just a ton, Twitter, Facebook, a ton of things set this up. And um, it's kind of annoying to use normally, but if your password manager supports it, it's awesome. Uh, it can paste in your password and then the next screen, it can paste in that code. It's maybe not as secure as using a separate program to do it, but it is still a ton more secure than just having that password. Um, you know, on the same note, if anybody ever asks you for one of these codes over the phone or over a text message, it is a surefire sign they're trying to get into your email account. That's a scam. Um, so if you want something that is a stronger guarantee of safety, it's a thing called the YubiKey. I'm not gonna talk about it very much here because we're not dealing in a world where we need to worry about people dedicated breaking into our stuff. The easiest way to get a hold of our data if you wanna be evil and work at it is to get a job at, in your study, um, which is usually an option. Um, so these are expensive enough and annoying enough to use that right now it's probably not better enough than software-based two-factor authentication. One other thing I was thinking of when I started this, like, well, what about the one that's built into Chrome or Apple's one or Firefox's one? Like, the, there are password managers built into a ton of products and they are better than not using a thing by far. They can all generate pretty good passwords. Um, the challenge is that once you start using them, your passwords go into that thing. And then like Apple's not gonna let you use your passwords on other systems. What if you wanna use Windows someday? Um, Chrome is not gonna let you share your passwords with Firefox. What if you wanna use Firefox someday? Firefox is the same way. Um, each of these things has a strategic business reason to get you locked into their world and not let you out very easily. Um, all of the big password manager programs, like it's in their interest to have their stuff work everywhere. Um, and they all also offer good ways to just, you know, save all of your passwords to a file so you can import it to something else. You do want to check to make sure that's really a feature that exists before you commit to storing your passwords in them. But I like, even though it costs a little bit of money, I like using one of the dedicated things so you're not beholden to just getting further and further into Apple or Google or Microsoft's ecosystem. Um, one other thing to think about uh, in particular uh, is every website you go to has a super helpful form that if you forget your password, they'll email it to you or they'll email you a link to let you set a new password. Every website has this. That means your email address is one account to rule them all. It is very, very special. Um, if somebody breaks into your email, they can break into every other one of your accounts. And there absolutely are evil programs that will look at your inbox, look to see all the sign up emails you've gotten, automatically send password reset requests to all of them, change all of your passwords, change your email password, and then they can hold that for ransom. Um, there's, there's a common thread there. Uh, so if there is nothing else that you get, to, get out of this, like even the human subject stuff is, you know, critical, but this is kind of part of that. Make sure your email password is different than your other passwords. You don't use it anywhere else. Even if you use the same password on every other website, your email password has to be unique and set up two-factor authentication for your email. Like those two things can save you from just a really bad day. I'm also gonna talk about stuff that, you know, is commonly used. I think it's a little bit overrated. Um, Virus checkers, I mean, you know, for UW-owned computers, this comes with software to do this. Leave it alone, don't mess with it. Um, you know, it does some good. It also lets Ty and David see what's happening centrally and check in on computers and make sure that any malware stuff gets nipped in the bud. Um, but otherwise, like on your personal computers, this stuff's built in now. Windows has Defender, Apple has its own thing. Um, you know, phones are generally pretty locked down. Um, the other thing is virus checkers have bugs and it's happened more than once that a bug in the virus checker let the virus checker get infected with a virus, which is bad in its own way. Um, so I don't think there's a terrible, but I probably wouldn't install one. I definitely wouldn't like pay money out of my pocket for one if, you know, the university didn't offer one for free.
VPNs also kind of useful, um, but they don't really address any of these problems of I've run a bad program and people stole my data or somebody stole my computer or I shared something. Like on dodgy networks, it's a good idea to use one. Like the free airport wireless, like, uh, it's, it's gross. Use a VPN if you're on that network, but it's not like your major first line of defense anywhere. Um, years ago, it was a really, really good idea to log in always as a non-admin on a Mac because you can do a lot of stuff as an admin. And that has gotten to be less and less and less over the years. And now it's maybe a good idea to do it, but it's also annoying enough that I don't myself. Um, most of the things, like you, if you've ever used a Mac recently, you've noticed a lot of things like, hey, this program wants to access your desktop or your documents or your photos. And that is the operating system trying to get in the way of programs that are trying to read those things. So a malware program can't just look through your photos library or read through all your files. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Most of, the, most of the really bad things programs can do either the operating system will try and stop them even if you're an admin, or you could even do it if you're not an admin. So that's the stuff that I have to talk about. Um, and I am very, very happy to take questions now. I don't know, ah, stop share, ha ha. Hey, Nate. Yes. Um, I was thinking about your um, suggestion to not mount study drive and just thinking about all the students we have working on data processing remotely, where they, mm -hmm. you know, may do, may do a remote desktop, but sometimes mm -hmm. they're using the, I think the, I might be not saying this correctly, but uh, like the Linux platform. So it's not the best right. GUI, like when they're accessing MATLAB or something, but they are still accessing study drive. So mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm just wondering, maybe because this is all through the university, it's not as much of a problem with things that David and Ty have implemented, but yeah, I guess Definitely. I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, I would say that remote desktop is generally a very secure way to do your stuff. Um, you know, more so than directly mounting study on your computer. It's a little bit of a different thing somehow, I guess. Um, yes, a bad program could like, intercept your remote desktop session and do some stuff, but that's not what they're gonna to tend to do unless they're really specifically targeting you. I'm worried more about like the, I'm gonna encrypt everything I see, or I'm gonna look through every file that I have access to. Remote desktop doesn't give programs access to that stuff. And again, for someone like me, who is actually mostly doing mounting study drive, I guess I, I hear, I'm hearing don't keep that connected. I mean, I'm, I tend to be logged off or actually quite honestly, my connection to AFCON lately has been so terrible mm -hmm. that I'm getting bumped yeah. off so many times anyway. It's not really like a long connection. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're using it to do work, yes, but don't like leave it on all the time when you're doing other stuff with your computer, probably. Okay. Yeah. I think we're more concerned about workflows that might involve copying files off the study drive to your own hard drive or stuff like that. Be very careful don't do that unless you have a extremely good reason uh it's file vault uh andrew asked does file vault on mac prevent malware from taking your files hostage no it does not um it's just a conference thief that thwarts um basically when you're logged in somebody can re-encrypt your encrypted files um and so then you have to pay the ransom or restore from backup. I didn't mention backups in this. Um, a backup is great from the well, security end of things. Uh, it's great from the, I don't care that you encrypted all of my files, so I'm not gonna give you $500 end of things, certainly. The, the trick to backups, of course, is that if you leave your backup drive always plugged into your computer and something encrypts all your files, it will also encrypt all your backups. So. Yes, don't leave your backup, backup drive plugged files. in 24 hours a day, right? Yeah. yeah, that whole thing. I'm assuming, so for the most part, I just access stuff by remote logging in, right, to my Keystone computer. And I'm assuming all the firewall encrypting, all the thing that needs to happen is just happening from BI world and I don't need to do anything there. Yep. 
that yeah. is extremely secure. Yeah. One question I have that keeps coming up lately is, uh, I think it's coming from Outlook for my email, is that I don't even know what the message says, but something about the certificate. And I think that's been something that's been coming up just the last few days when I open email and it just asks if I want to proceed. Is there any weird security thing happening there? Ty, Ty and I are working on that right now. We had a, we had a cert expire and, and Ty's actually working on the replacement cert this afternoon. We've been emailing back and forth. So that's a, that's a, that's a, that's your, your software working the way it's supposed to and warning you that there's something funny about the, the security certificate that it's using to, to validate the whole conversation. And okay. so that should go away in, in, in a day or two. We're All working right. on that right now. Sorry about that. No worries. Just makes yeah. me laugh because I'm like, yeah, I want to continue. And then I was like, wait, not that there's anything in my email that's, you know, subject data, but I'm like, yeah, I want to proceed because I want to, you know. Yep. Yep. Cool. Right. And then Outlook in the university world does have the encrypt the end to end emails. Uh, if you do need to use that, but I would still recommend not doing that to transfer anything important unless you absolutely have to. Yeah, if you're really thoughtful about setting up encrypted email workflows, it can work, but it's real fiddly and it's prone to mistakes and I don't love it. But if you need to use email for a thing and people are on the same email service and you can work together a bunch, like it's a thing that it, it can work for people sometimes. Yeah, we Normally had to I would do try that to find another because way subject payments were happening from you know the school of education and but they were our subjects and the names back and forth so that's the way we did it with sending excel in, in, in encrypted email mm -hmm. do you guys have a suggestion if this is something that's going to continue to happen for us as researchers is like the best platform for getting stuff that is identifiable information to other people either on campus or external researchers I'd imagine external researchers is less of a necessary of, you know, phone number, you know, address name, but like in this instance, this department needed that information. Yeah. I think box is confirmed for HIPAA as long as you talk to your IRB. I'm not sure. I think there's a way to make that work. Yes, um, it has to be a specifically set up box area. You can also grant people outside of us access to your REDCap project if people are willing to go that route. Um, I mean, there's a learning curve to using REDCap. So it might not be an option, but I guess it's one of those like, this sounds like a thing to handle on a case by case basis. Um, we will help you find solutions if you ask. Um, the School of Medicine uses something called uh, a file send utility called Zentu. And um, they have a some phrase that you need to add separately and, and that's how that's managed. It's encrypted as well. Cool. Yeah, and there are also ways to get people access outside of CHM access to a study drive. Um, it's, I mean, if they're outside the university, it's more complicated, but yeah, there are a bunch of ways we can approach it. Well, thanks for your time today, Nate. I'm gonna stop recording, questions can continue. Cool. David, I hope I haven't said anything that was too much of a lie. <laughs>